Take your Bibles this morning, and we're just gonna we're just gonna be in the book of Mark this morning, just for today. Next week, we're gonna start a new series, a new book. Uh, we're gonna. This past week has been a great week. I've been in two different books, just trying to find the mind of the Lord and to see where He wanted us to go and where I thought He wanted us to go. We're not going there. We're going in a different direction, and we're going. So starting next week for. For a few few bit of weeks, we're going to be studying the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah. I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. <laughs> Normally, I, Ecclesiastes, you might hear go, ugh. <laughs> but what a book for us to read. A book for us to study. Um, I think it's going to be a wonderful time, and we'll look at the first part of it next week. But today... Because today's Lord's Supper, or for you European folks, communion, because of that, I just thought we'd focus on Jesus. And the worship team has already done a wonderful job of doing that, and uh, all of our songs have been about Jesus today. So that's what we're going to look at. We're just going to look at Jesus for a few minutes. And if you don't know him as your friend, your savior, your anchor, your hope, Oh, I pray that you would come to know him today. Mark chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 34. And the Bible says there, And Jesus went on his way with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that I am? And they told him, Well, you know, John the Baptist... Others say that you're Elijah, and others even just say that you're one of the other prophets. But then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, he answered him, well, you are the Christ. And then he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And then Jesus began to teach the disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that they would kill him. And then after three days, he would rise again. And he said this very plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter. And said, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen? This text is increasingly ever more becoming one of the foundational texts for me as a Christian, as a preacher, as a believer. This is such an important text. You you see, this text answers three of the most important truths, questions, statements, things that you can consider in your mind I'm going to have to start preaching over here a little bit. We, we have a group of guys there. And, uh, th- you know, it answers th- that truth, that, that most important question that can ever be asked or ever pondered. Who is Jesus? The text answers who is Jesus, why is Jesus come, and what does it mean to follow Jesus? Who is he? Why did he come, and what is it to follow him? So I've titled this message, The Who, Why, and What of Jesus. And the reason that we're here this morning is because we are going to remember Christ and his sacrifice in just a little bit of time. We're going to take the bread and be reminded that He just didn't die a martyr's death. He didn't do that. 
but he was broken for us. He shed his blood to cover us. He, he did that so that all the payment, all the debt, all that was necessary to deal with Satan and to deal with sin, he did that on the cross. And we have the wonderful privilege of remembering that by taking the bread and juice and taking our mind to the foot of that cross and remembering what Christ, not, not what he did for those boys, not what he did for the other sitting next to you, and not what he did for the world, but what he did for you. He died for you. And that's what we're going to remember this morning. We're going to remember Christ. We're going to remember his offering to the Father. You know, it's just not about remembering the horrible thing that happened to him. The whipping and the scourging and the cursing and the mockery. The pain that he endured with the nails in his body and hanging on that cross for all those hours. The wrath of God that was poured out on him because you and I are sinners. It's not just remembering all that. But it's about remembering Jesus himself. Personally, what he did for me. And when Jesus, the night before he was crucified, when he was doing the Passover with his disciples, he took those Passover elements and he looked at his disciples and he offered them the bread. And then when he offered them the bread, he said to them, this you do to remember me. It's not about just what he endured. It's about remembering the Christ personally for our lives. That's why we're here this morning. So let's just take a few minutes and let's think about him as we prepare our heart and our mind for this Lord's Supper, for this communion time. So I just ask you, according to our text, what should we remember? What truth? should we think about, about Jesus? See, the, the first truth, really the only truth that is necessary, the most important thing that can ever be asked of a person is this question, who is Jesus? Without understanding who Jesus is, you can't even get past and go to anything else. You, you can't even understand what he did for you until you understand who he is. See, in our text this morning, Jesus gets us to think about the most important question, the most important truth that can ever be asked, and that, who is he? Who is he personally? Not just for the people around, but who do you believe that he is? He asked his disciples, who does everybody say I am? Jesus has been preaching. He's only a couple of months now away from the crucifixion. They are on their way to Jerusalem, and from this point onward in his ministry to the disciples, he is going to focus on teaching them that he's going to suffer for sin. The question is, that he asked them, what, what does everybody think, who, who do they think that I am? And they said, well, John, one of the prophets, Elijah, they, they, they think you're something important. And then Jesus said to Peter and the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered with the most amazing truth. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are God's anointed. You are the one sent from God to this world. And you know what he was saying with that that one little super beautiful, amazing statement that you are the Christ. What he was saying is, you, you are the answer to man's failure. You are the answer to man's sin and sinfulness. Let me take you back to where it began. This Messiah wasn't 
this truth of the Messiah, the coming one from God, the anointed one, the one sent from God to deal with sin, wasn't something new, wasn't just something that, you know, they decided to believe when they formed the nation of Israel or when they went into the promised land. It was from the very start of all this. See, after Adam and Eve, Eve had sinned against God, disobeyed him, succumbed to the temptation of the serpent of Satan, and they, they were now before God, and God had come down into the garden and said, where are you? And he knew where they were, but they were hiding from God because when they ate of the fruit of that tree, they lost their innocence. They realized that they were naked and they realized their shame now before God. And they hid from God and they tried to cover themselves and God called out to them and finally they came and God spoke to them and dealt with them and, and I believe they repented and, and God clothed them with the skin of an animal, shed the blood for it. And he turned over to the serpent and he said this, the very first messianic promise in Scripture. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And here's what he will do. The one who will come, he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's a picture of the cross. See, bruising, I don't know about you, but if someone was going to bruise me, I'd rather have my heel bruised. I'd rather have my foot hit, damaged, broken than my head. Why? This is where life is. This is where power is. This is where the authority is. And what God was saying to the serpent was this. You are going to, the one that I send to deal with sin, you will hurt him, but he will destroy you. And he will destroy the power that you have over people. He will destroy the power that sin has over people. You are done for. And with this statement from Peter that you are the Christ, he is saying you are the coming one. You're the one that has come to destroy the destruction that has come into our world. God is simply telling Satan, you will be defeated and Peter is saying, you've come to defeat him. You are the one God has told us about. You are the one that will destroy him and his power over us. See, that's the right answer. You know what I love? I love how the Gospels, you know, the Gospel of Mark gives a little bit of it here. The Gospel of Matthew gives a little bit of it here. Listen to what Matthew says. It's the same story. It's Peter acknowledging who who Christ is, but in Matthew expounds it a little bit more. He says in Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter replied to the question, who do you say that I am? And he says here, Matthew writes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Who is Jesus? He is God that has come to this world to destroy Satan and his power over you and over I. The one that is coming to destroy him. Isn't that an amazing thought? Isn't that a wonderful truth? Just look in your own mind's eye at what Satan is destroying today. He is destroying people left and right. And the Savior has come and he's dealt with it. He's done everything that needs to be done to destroy, to stop to hold it back, to end the power and the reign that he has over people. He is not only just a man. He is God who has come to do that. You know, I love John 1.1. 1, 1. Most of you probably know it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he, God, came to his own. But his own people did not receive him. But to all who do receive him, who believed on his name, he has given the right to become children of God. Who were born, not 
not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, John writes. The glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's who Jesus is. The son of the living God. The second person of the Trinity. He is God. You want to know how much God loves you? This is what he's done for you. He has come to destroy and defeat the power of sin and Satan over your life. I'm glad my daughter's here this morning because this quote is for her. Not the meaning of the quote, just the author of the quote. She goes, oh, it's by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, he writes the following, and I quote. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish things that people often say about Jesus. They say, oh, you know what? I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say, C.S. Lewis says. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. But you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of the living God, or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him him being a great human teacher. He He has not left that option open to us. And he never intended to. He is God. He is the one that came to answer Genesis 3.15. He, say it this way, God entered our time, put on human flesh, and then by his stripes, We can be healed. Amen? That's who Jesus is. That is the first and most important truth that anybody in this room could ever consider. He is not just someone who sits in the driver's seat and you say, hey, Jesus, take the wheel. He is not just simply someone who, you know, when you're in trouble. And most of my trouble, to be honest with you, it's because of me. You know, he's not just someone who, when you're in trouble, you go, oh, oh, God, help me. I promise if you get me out of this trouble, I'll do better. He is the one that you and I should do like those those elders in heaven that are described in in Revelation 4 or 5, where they fall absolutely flat on their face, prostrate before the living God, and sing incessantly, holy, 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 holy. You say he only wrote three in the Bible. Do you know what that means? It's an overemphasis of saying they kept on crying out, you are holy. 
That's how we need to see Jesus. He is the holy God who came. And by his stripes we are healed. This text tells us a second truth that we remember this morning. And I hope and pray that we are remembering who, God, who, who Jesus is this morning, individually. The second truth that we must remember and, concern, and, and be concerned with is this. Why did he come? I got so excited, I've already told you, but I'm going to tell you again. Why did Jesus come? It tells us in the script. Here's what Jesus said. Verse 31. And he began to teach these dead-headed disciples. That's not actually in my text. But that's what they were. They were rocks, man. They, they, just, they just couldn't get it. And even to the very end, Peter's trying to pull out a sword and go, I'm going to stop them, Jesus. You know? But here's what the Lord was doing for months now. He's going to tell them. His, the Bible says in a passage in the scriptures that Jesus has fixed his eyes on Jerusalem. He has set his heart to the cross. He set his mind to fulfill what God has sent him to do. And there ain't a thing that's going to deter him. And that is this. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. I don't know where, I don't know who wrote this, but I'll, I'll read you this. After Peter declared that Jesus is the Messiah, because you know what Pete wanted? Pete wanted Jesus to rock up to the, to the, to the Roman government and say, yo, you out, I'm in. That's what they wanted. They wanted him to just say, hey, hey, I'm kicking the Romans out and we're going to have ourselves an Israeli good time. But that's not why he came. He didn't came, come to make it all good that way. He came to make it all right here. And when Peter declared that Jesus is Messiah, God's anointed when the Son of God, God himself, Jesus began to teach them what that actually meant. To be Messiah meant that he was going to suffer and be rejected and mocked and stripped naked to shame him and nail his body to pieces of wood and to let him Stay in agony for hours because of our sin. He had to come and suffer. He had to come and pay the price. What being the Messiah meant, what he had come to do, and this is the turning point in his teaching, he was going to teach them that he had to be the suffering Messiah. They didn't want any part of that. You see, Several times in Jesus' life, he shows that he was a man on a mission. He wasn't on a moral mission. He wasn't on a societal mission. He, he wasn't on a political mission. He was on a spiritual mission. He had a purpose, which he intentionally fulfilled. He came to do what his father had sent him to do. His father sent him to reconcile you and I together. His father sent him. And I don't think it took, may work like this, but let's just pretend. Son, they messed it up. He knew they would. We always knew they would. When you and I were here and we created the angelic beings and, and we created the world, we knew what they would do. Are you ready? And the son said, yes. And he came. He came to do that. He came to fulfill his father's will. And even at a young age, Jesus 
of Jesus. That was his mission. Do you remember when I think he was 12 years old and he, he hung out in Jerusalem and, and his whole, all his family left and was going back home and he stayed and after a day or so they were like, where's Jesus? He's back there. And when they found him, dad was like, what's going on? And Jesus said, you know, I must be about my father's business. And in the last days of his earthly life, Jesus did this very same thing. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem where he knew he would be killed and that he would die and that he would suffer the wrath of God. It could be said that the fundamental mission of Christ's time on earth was to fulfill God's Saving eternal plan of saving the lost. That's why he came. Jesus put it this way in Luke. Today, salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Isn't it a wonderful blessing to know the only reason if you believe today the only reason that you do is because he came after you. We, if we shared the stories that we have of how he came after us, they'd all be different. God works in mysterious and wonderful ways, does he not? He'll call an eight-year-old child. He'll call a 90-year-old adult. He'll come after the ones he's seeking to find. That was his mission. He came to save sinners. Here is, what Jesus, here is what for Jesus is the point in our text when he would teach his disciples why he would really come. Not set up in a government, but to set up a spiritual kingdom. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins and not only for our sins but the sins of the world if you're here this morning and you're, you're not a believer you, you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ you haven't accepted that he is God you haven't understood that you know he, he wasn't some good moral teacher with a martyrdom thing in his mind but it, th this him going to the cross and being murdered was the plan of God from eternity that was necessary to pay for your sins. If, 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 if you're not a Christian and, and, and this is the first time that you ever heard of it, here's the whole point of the matter. You're dead spiritually without life unless Christ becomes your sacrifice. He is the sacrifice, the payment of our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the world, which means no matter how badly you and I have sinned, no matter how badly and terribly we've run from God, no matter how wickedly we have cursed his name, or no matter if you took a rifle, an air rifle, as a teenage boy, and set up the Bible because you were so angry at God and shot it full of holes. He still came to seek and to save you. See, I was that little boy that got so mad at God that took out my air rifle and I just pummeled it with BBs. Shot it full of holes. But I could not push him away. He came to seek and to save the most wicked. Here's what Peter said about it. When Jesus told him what he has come to do, when Jesus told him that he's come to pay for sin, here's what Peter said. Peter took him aside and said, no way. The Bible says in Mark 8, 32, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Do you know what he was doing? He was telling Jesus, listen, you don't have to suffer. 
You don't have to go to the cross. He was doing the same thing Satan did when tempted him in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry and said, hey, make this bread, do this, and you'll be okay. And Jesus said, said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every dependence on God. Peter was saying, you don't need to do that. He was trying to divert him from the cross. And it is the cross, my beloved, that we need this morning. Peter didn't want the description of a Savior that would suffer. He wanted one in his own understanding, in his own image, in his own design, in his own make. And what we need to understand is, you need to know who Jesus is. He's God. You need to know why he came to be the suffering Messiah for your sin. Don't turn him into a different God. Our world wants to make Jesus out. He's just come to make you healthy and wealthy. He's just come to encourage you. He's come to just love you. You might want to turn Jesus into just love. Meaning, no matter what you do, it's okay. You don't have to confess your sinfulness because, hey, Jesus is a God of love. And you know love is stupid, right? Just love accepts anything. It just, you know, love is ignorant. Love is blind. No. Love is truth. And the truth said, it will set you free. Listen. Don't make him what he ain't. You may turn Jesus into someone who set a good example for living life. And you might say then, okay, I'll try to emulate that. I'll turn the other cheek. What do you do when you run out of cheeks? I'll emulate Christ. No. No, you won't. Because it's impossible to do. You can't. You may even say, Jesus is the one of many ways to God. One of many routes to the favored destination. Absolutely no. That's ridiculous. That's, that's saying the same thing as, oh, you just come to Jesus. He'll accept you and keep you just the way you are. And you're turning faith into something else. You're turning Christ into something else. And when you say there's many routes to heaven, you're a fool. Because you know there is only one way to God. And Jesus himself said, I am the way. I am the only way and the only truth and the only life. And no one will come to the Father except through me. Again, he's either a lunatic liar or that's the truth. Jesus died because our sin is so reprehensible. He came to save sinners because we are separated from God. And we can do nothing on our part about it except fall in absolute humility before the living God and say, I'm sorry. I have sinned against you and I have done wrong. And without you, I am dead. Without you, I am lost. Without you, I am in an eternity in hell for eternity. That's the only thing that we can do. Respond to what Jesus has done. Because he paid for our price. And then I close with this. We've answered the question. We've seen the truth of who Jesus is. He's God our Savior. We've seen why Jesus has come to this world. He's come to save the lost. Now let's answer. What does it mean to follow him? You know who he is now. You know why he's come now. Will you follow him? See, the Bible says in verse 34 in our text, I love it. The questions of who do you, who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? The response of, you know, I'm going to die. That was to the disciples. The disciples said, nope, nope, and nope. And then Jesus like, hey, Claudette, Michelle, come over here. Don't, don't, but he, he, he's calling people. 
Bethany and Christian, come here. Hey, dude with the fishes, come close. You know what he began to do? Yeah, y'all would turn around. Who's got fish in this place? <laughs> you know what he began to do? He began to call the crowd to him. The multitude. Praise God. Aren't you glad he didn't come for a few, but he came for the multitude? And he began to call them, and he said, listen, listen, if anyone, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would be my follower, he says, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What does that mean? I think the Amplified ver Translation has an amazing way of expounding that verse. Jesus called the crowd together with his disciples. And he said to all of them, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself. He must set aside self-interests. And take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come for Jesus. And to follow me. What does that mean to follow Christ, really? What does it really mean? It means believing in Jesus Christ. Conforming to his example in living. And if need be, suffering or perhaps even dying because of faith in Jesus Christ. He was telling his, that crowd of people, I'm going to die for your sin. And it, you don't have to say, oh dear Jesus, come into my heart. You don't have to go to confession and communion. You don't have to do anything. But if you want to follow me, if you want me, you have to deny yourself. What does that mean? Self-denial is not to deny your own personality. It's not to deny, to self-denial doesn't mean, oh, I'm, I'm going to die as a martyr. Self-denial doesn't mean you become a monk and you lock yourself up in a very dungy, damp, disgusting place and you eat bread and water for decades and it's like, I have earned God. I've shown him that I can control self. That's not self-denial. You know what self-denial is? It is Self-denial is rather a denial of self. Right? Let me explain. Do you know what our biggest problem is here? Our biggest problem of not worshiping God as God is because we have a first God. And that first God is us. Self-denial is turning away from the idolatry of self-centeredness, of pride, and every attempt to orient one's life by the dictates of self-interest. In a way, self-denial is saying, Lord, just don't take the wheel. Take the drive shaft, take the engine, take the transmission, take the tires, take the rubber, take it all, because I can't. That's self-denial. Self-denial is saying, Lord, I don't deserve forgiveness, but you offer it, and I'll take it. You know what, taking up your cross, people think, oh, I'm, I'm bearing my cross, I, I got my burdens financially, and you know, my health burden, no, no, that's not your cross. You know what your cross is? Your cross is your life. And you say, I'm going to take up my cross, my life, and I'm going to willingly give it to you. It's yours. Giving your life away to Jesus. Saying yes to God's will and God's way. To take up one's cross was to demonstrate publicly that you have utterly and totally submitted and in, in, in are in obedience to the authority 
of Christ. Do you know what we want? We want Jesus, what he gives us, but we don't want to give him control of our life. We're like, Lord, I want heaven, but man, heaven forbid that I really want to like let you control everything. Because let me tell you something, Jesus doesn't take you down the flowery path all the time. Sometimes Jesus takes you down the rose bush path. My neighbors got rose bushes, and those suckers, they grow like crazy. And when they're away, we get a lot of their mail, so I take it to their house or their boxes or something. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's dangerous to go to their front door. Oftentimes, literally, in the summer when I'm wearing a t-shirt, I come back, oh, were you at their house again? Yeah, she's, I see the blood. That's the path Jesus will take you down. Hey, 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 you want to follow Christ? You might be a martyr for Jesus. You follow Christ? You might not have much worldly anything. But that's okay, but if you have Jesus, you got everything. Listen, deny yourself, take up your cross, and you know what? Just follow him. That term in the verse 34 there where it says, follow me, it's a term that it's continuous. It means, okay then, keep following. Keep saying no to self. Keep saying yes to God. That is to continue throughout one's entire life. Following Jesus simply means believing who he is, why he came, conforming to the image of Christ. That was Paul's whole beautiful desire to be more like Jesus and yielding to his will in your life. That's what believing in Jesus truly means. Jesus is the Savior. He's the Messiah. He paid for sin, died for you, rose again to prove it. Now what will you do with that? And when we take the bread in our pre-potted, very healthy and safe juice, is it just going to be a thing to you? Or are you going to sit and remember what that beautiful God did for me? In preparation for Lord's Supper, I would like to ask uh, the worship team to come we're going to sing a song. Jerry, what's it again? I can't. When, I when I survey the wondrous cross. Sing it prayerfully. <laughs> sing it out loud. Sing it meditatively. Sing it standing. Sing it sitting. Singing prostrate. I don't care. <laughs> but let us not take lightly <laughs> the night before he died. And he took the bread and the wine and he said, do this to remember what I've done for you. Let it mean something this morning.